Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Ojeda, and I'm the Marketing and Public Relations Manager for Grand Canyon Conservancy, and we are the official nonprofit partner to Grand Canyon National Park. And all week long, we are celebrating National Park Week and our second annual Trailblazer event, highlighting stories, facts, and educational content showcasing Grand Canyon. So today, we have a special guest interview with Serena Rana from Trails Inspire. She's an author, hiker, and fellow canyon head to talk to us today about the Arizona Trail and her experiences hiking Green Canyon. So before I welcome her in, for those of you that have watched the live broadcast with us before, you guys know my favorite part is seeing where you're joining us from. So comment below with your hometown so together we can all stay connected no matter where you're watching from. So and also if you have any questions today for Serena or myself, put those in the comments and we will do our best to go back and answer them. So to get on with today's programming, it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Serena. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. We are really excited to have you here. You have a very unique story, and I think it's going to be a good inspiration for folks that maybe can't get to the canyon, but that want to maybe try a hike in their afternoon. So do you have anything that you want to add before we jump into some of our questions? Yes, I do. I would like to acknowledge the 11 traditionally associated tribes of Grand Canyon, uh, the Havasupai tribe, the Hopi tribe, the Wallapai tribe, the Kaiba Band of Paiute Indians, San Juan Southern Paiute tribe, Las Vegas Band of Paiute Indians, Moapa Band of Paiute Indians, Paiute Indian tribe of Utah, the Navajo Nation, the Pueblo of Zuni, and the Yavapai Apache Nation. Thank you so much for that introduction, Serena. For us, you know, a big part of um, a lot of our initiatives at GCC this year is that tribal connection. So I really appreciate you leading in with that acknowledgement. So I'm really curious to know, how did you get into hiking and what has inspired your love for the outdoors? Well, I didn't grow up hiking as we think of it today, like, you know, putting on a backpack with full of stuff and going hiking. Um, although I did spend a lot of my time in my childhood, uh, the neighborhood that I grew up in, there was a big field next to it that was forest. And um, we, I spent a lot of time there as a kid. And I always enjoyed the outdoors. Like my, my family and I would go on park, national park trips and things like that. But my parents are both immigrants. My mom is from Italy and my dad's from India. And so we didn't really have that kind of cultural background to go out and do hikes. It, and it's, it's interesting because my dad, he just loves the outdoors. It just wasn't something that, you know, was in his, in his culture. And so we did a lot of car touring and things like that. Um, I moved from the Chicago suburbs where I grew up to Arizona to study anthropology at the University of Arizona in 1994. And that's when I really got associated with hiking as I do it today, you know, filling up a backpack, but still then it was just very small day hikes. And unfortunately, when I was in my last semester of college, I was hit by a car while walking across the street. And that caused me to develop a chronic pain condition called fibromyalgia. And for me, the symptoms were extreme pain, fatigue. Um, it caused a huge disruption in my life. And um, for many years, I was, I was very, very sick. And at one point I even lost my job after I graduated and I was bedridden for a period of time. So at basically my lowest, I decided to start taking walks with my dog. I had a big giant German shepherd named Zeus. And so Zeus was always up for our walk. So our small walks very, very slowly uh, turned into longer walks and those longer walks turned into hikes. And um, as I hiked more, I realized that it was something that really kept my mind off of the pain and the effects of the fibromyalgia had had on my life. And so that's where it really, you know, my love for the outdoors grew and I just wanted more of it because the more I experienced the better I felt and the more confident I got. And so, you know, when I'm telling people about hiking, you know, I've since hiked thousands and thousands of miles and, you know, I've done long distance trails, but I always go back to that, you know, person that was just starting out and like that mindset. And that really helped me to write the book. You know, starting out on some of those hikes, 
um, I, you know, I'm curious to know how you kind of experienced what the Arizona landscape was and having that time to reflect, do you feel like it's made a difference with your pain management or do you feel like, again, it's just more of that distraction? Hiking has always been a really important way for me to manage my fibromyalgia. Um, not only because it keeps my mind off of the pain, but it also keeps my body moving. It's kind of counterintuitive because when you're in pain, sometimes all you want to do is lie there on the couch. But I always find that if I just get myself out and it doesn't have to be anything that's like, you know, epic or amazing. And, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be a multi-day backpacking trip. It can be something as simple as walking with my dog outside or even, you know, just going and sitting outside in a chair and, you know, listening to birds and things like that. You know, that connection with the outdoors is so important to me and it's enriched my life so much that I've basically restructured my entire life to spend as much time outdoors as possible. Thank you, Serena, for sharing that and your story. And I think it's great. And there might be some viewers that are watching with us today that can resonate and connect with that. And, you know, we talk about nature being this transformative and, you know, a real place to find solace and peace. Um, but I love to hear everyone's individual experiences on how getting outside is connected them to just something else. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so I want to dig into a little bit more about your hiking experiences. So living in Tucson and Arizona based and really what your book is about. Can you share with us a little more about the Arizona trail? Um, what does that path look like? And for viewers who may not be familiar, how long is it? So I'll give you some stats and facts. Um, the Arizona trail was first developed in 1985. It was first hiked by Dale Shewalter. He, there was no Arizona trail to speak of at that time. Um, he was a Flagstaff math teacher and he wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail, but he couldn't take that much time off of work. So he was looking for something a little closer to home. So he developed a route of his own using some trails that still that already existed and then bushwhacking and making his own way between certain parts that didn't have any trail in 1985. And that trail eventually became the Arizona National Scenic Trail. And it's only one of 11 National Scenic Trails in the country. Um, so some facts and stats, uh, it's 800 miles. It's open to hikers, bikers, and equestrians. It was designated as a national scenic trail in 2009. It was completed and connected across the state at the Gila River in 2011. It's got three national parks, Grand Canyon being my favorite, of course. Um, one state park, which is Oracle State Park, seven wilderness areas, four national forests, 33 gateway communities, which are these trail towns that are on or near the trail. And it crosses nine mountain ranges, the Mogollon Rim, which is the edge of the Colorado Plateau and the Grand Canyon. It's protected and maintained by the Arizona Trail Association. And in the Grand Canyon, the Arizona Trail goes rim to rim via the South Kaibab and North Kaibab trails. So if you run rim to rim or you backpack rim to rim, You've been on the Arizona Trail. Wow. So have you hiked it from edge to edge? And, you know, how would you say, how familiar are you with the trail now? Well, I have basically lived and worked and built the trail and played. And, you know, I've been on this trail since 2007. And there's just nothing like it. It's so wonderful that that's what keeps me going back again and again. I section hiked the trail um, to raise awareness for fibromyalgia in 2008, 2009. And before I did that, I had only been on two backpacking trips in my whole life. Uh, one to the bottom of the Grand Canyon that was extremely intense. Uh, and then one small solo overnight. So I did the entire trail within a period of 15 months going out and section hiking it a uh, piece at a time. I completed the trail for the first time on May 12th, 2009, Fibromyalgia Awareness Day. After I completed the trail, I was so interested in spreading the word about it because not a lot of people knew about it because at that time it wasn't completed yet. And I was actually part of the trail crew that helped to build a lot of the miles down by Tucson. I volunteered um, for years and years to help build the trail. And so when I came back from my section hike, I was just so inspired and it really made such a difference in my life. 
the biggest thing was that it gave me confidence to do things that I never thought were possible. Because if I could hike 800 miles across Arizona, what else could I do that um, you know, seemed impossible before? And so I promoted the trail on my own. And uh, in 2011, I was asked by the uh, executive director to become the gateway community liaison for the Arizona Trail Association. And so for five years, I was the gateway community liaison and I traveled the state uh, promoting the trail to the towns and explaining to the towns where these dirty backpackers were coming from. <laughs> <laughs> why there was all of a sudden these people springing up in their towns and, and that they're not homeless. They're actually there to like spend money in your town and things like that. So I developed a <laughs> community program and promoted the Arizona Trail uh, between 2011 and 2016. And then 2017, I started my own company, Trails Inspire, which promotes the outdoors through writing and photography and public speaking and trail design. So when I was working for the Arizona Trail Association as the Gateway Community Liaison, the uh, original guidebook came out. I put together a through hike to promote the guidebook and the gateway communities and the Arizona Trail itself. I hiked the entire trail. It took me about two and a half months uh, from March till the end of May. And along the way I had events, 13 of them where I promoted the Arizona Trail to the gateway communities. So I would hike into a community and then we'd have an event with music, food and Arizona Trail Ale. And so not only did I hike the entire trail again, um, then when I was doing the research for my book, I rehiked all of those hikes in my book again. So you can say that I spent a lot of time on the trail and that doesn't even count the amount of time that I've spent on the trail just for fun. There are pieces of the trail that I've hiked over and over and over again. For example, I'm the trail steward for a piece of trail in Oracle, actually the piece of trail where I got the idea to hike the entire trail. And I've hiked that piece so many times I can't even count. So it's just neat to go back over and over again. It's like the Grand Canyon, you know, you see something new every time. So when you go out, you know, whether you're doing a day hike or a backpacking hike, what are some essentials that you make sure you take with you and how do you pack for your trips? Packing for trips is something that I've refined over the years, and I have a pretty good desert kit together. Um, of course, in the desert, there's always, always the first thing that you think about is water. So I carry water for myself plus extra because you never know what's going to happen. Um, you can have just enough water, and then what happens if you, you know, are going slower than you thought or you have an injury and you're out there you know in the desert you only have the water you're carrying with you a lot of times and so you know water is very important some sort of sun protection i mean arizona is so even if it's cold it's so sunny and you know people get burnt all the time so sunscreen sun protection i actually prefer to cover myself from head to toe rather than slather myself with sunscreen so I'll use like a sun protective shirt that's long sleeved and has even thumb holes. So it covers the, arm, the hands a bit. I use an umbrella, which is one of my favorite Grand Canyon hacks ever, or just in general, the desert, you know, because the, the sun is so intense, even if it's the winter, like I said. And so to carry your own shade around with you is amazing. I usually get like a two section look. The first look is like, oh, that person's so silly, they have an umbrella. And then they realize that I have shade. And so I've been hiking with a Gossamer Gear reflective umbrella for years. And it's made out of carbon fiber too. So it's real light and it's really sturdy. So it can stand up to those Grand Canyon winds. I like that you called out an umbrella. It's, um, it's one where we've had some guides on and talked about our lives before, but mm -hmm. that is like their super specific, you know, kind of hack of a tool that they bring because same thing within the canyon, you don't get shade, especially if you're on South Kaibab or on the Tonto, you're exposed and you need to be able to create your own shade because that's what's going to give you that reprieve. So um, it, it's great that it aligns with some of those recommended tools that people may not think of to bring. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another thing is to be prepared for giant swings in temperature because the desert is a place of extremes and so layers are really important you know to, even if it it's going to be hot that day maybe later in the day it won't be so hot or if you start out and it's cold then it's going to get hot later in the day so you know having those layers is really important that you can take on and off as you, and so that you're comfortable 
So I noticed in your book that there is a little companion that travels around with you. And I just think it's adorable. And I would love for you to share the story. Who is the adorable micro chicken? So in preparation, I actually, well, so first of all, you've got to see micro chickens home. <laughs> Old school film canister. And then this is my adorable adventure companion, micro chicken. In 2011, I was looking for a gift for my nephew and at the register, there was a small container of these tiny, tiny chickens. And I just thought it was the cutest thing ever. And so it became my mascot. I carry micro chicken around in a little film canister, lives in my backpack, goes on adventures with me, has been rafting down the Grand Canyon 24 times. <laughs> I mean, has hiked the Arizona Trail with me, you know, all the way across in 2014. So Micro Chicken's got some serious adventures going on and also has his, his own Instagram. And, uh, you know, I hike solo a lot. So this makes me feel not so alone and it's adorable for photos. He is pretty cute. So thank you for sharing. And um, if anyone else has a go-to traveling companion, um, like Serena's micro chicken, put it in the comments. We'd love to see your photos on where your guys' companions go with you. Um, but I do want to circle back because you did talk about how the Arizona Trail does traverse through uh, three different national parks. And so with Grand Canyon being one of it, what was your experience during that stretch of hiking it through the Grand Canyon? And, you know, what was your connections with the canyon even prior to hiking the Arizona Trail? I, I know you said your second trip was backpacking trip was in the Grand Canyon. First. First, you, you go all in. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually, uh, when I moved to Arizona, I had never been out here before. I never visited. I chose the University of Arizona because it was really good for anthropology. And I knew I didn't want to walk through the snow. Uh, so I didn't know what it was going to look like. And I drove across the, across the country with all of my stuff. And I had a boyfriend at the time. We did make made a little road trip out of it. And one of the places that we stopped was the Grand Canyon. It was like one of the first places we stopped when we got into Arizona. And little did I know, I actually hiked the Arizona Trail on the South Kaibab Trail. That was my very first hike I ever did in Arizona. And I remember just being completely blown away. I mean, just that, especially that first view where it doesn't even look real. And it looks like every photo you've seen, but your brain's trying to comprehend it. And then that experience of actually going into it and how the perspective changes so much. I always tell people, even if you just go down a little bit, like a couple, you know, even if you just go down a couple switchbacks, it's a completely different world down there than looking down from the rim. And so the first hike I did was South Kaibab to Cedar Ridge, which is remains one of my absolute favorite day hikes and you know one that I recommend to everybody. And I just remember everything about it was so incredible, like the scenery, but also the physicality of trying to get yourself out of the canyon was something that was really new to me. And you know, I didn't even know at that time, I didn't know anything about the canyon. I didn't even know that, you know, I I didn't really know about backpacking so much. I had no idea. I never even considered rafting in the canyon. And, uh, you know, to go from that to spending so much time there, and I eventually became a river guide for Arizona River Runners and Grand Canyon Whitewater. I've always been enchanted by it from the very first time that I saw it. So I have to ask, so having that experience as a river guide, and then also all of your experience hiking the canyon, if you had to pick between rafting it or hiking it, what would you choose? Oh, well, since rafting, you get both. You can raft and hike. And also rafting gets you really close to stuff that's very, very hard to get to on foot. Um, perfect example is Elf's Chasm. I had been to Elf's Chasm in the Grand Canyon and it took me days of just really brutal backpacking to get there. And on the river, you float right up and it's a very, very short hike. And so things like that, you know, it's, it's the combination. My, my heart will always go with the big, long solo backpacking trip, but rafting is 
amazing. And it's a, it's a really incredible way to see the Grand Canyon. I had done a lot of hiking in the Grand Canyon before I even went on the river and seeing the, from the river is like seeing a different side of something that you absolutely love and just, ex, you know, experiencing that awe and, you know, there's places that you can, you can't see by foot that you see on the river. And it's just really neat. I, I just find in general, I just find the Grand Canyon endlessly fascinating. So any method that I can use to see it, I think gives a different perspective. And I have a question for you too. I know you had mentioned that you are gonna be starting maybe a through hike through the canyon. Do you mind talking about what that stretch entails and what have you been doing to prep for it? So I'm not doing, I'm doing a section hike, but I am hiking the entire length of the canyon. Um, so I've been working on this. Uh, I did my first piece actually in 2009 and I've been piecing, you know, piecing it together uh, year by year. I, I did take the last year off because of the pandemic, obviously, <laughs> but um, I have been doing sections since 2009 and it's just a way to see the Grand Canyon. It's, a, it's an amazing way to traverse the Grand Canyon. I've always, I was always interested in the Tonto Trail and I hiked the entire length of the Tonto Trail. And then it was like, well, what, what else is there? You know, how, how can I see more of this? And then, you know, beyond that, then you get into some more intense travel, bushwhacking, finding your own way, things like that. But I just find it so rewarding. And even though sometimes it's just the hardest thing ever, you know, to get through the day and it's so brutal and so, you know, it can be so intense and so physical, but the reward is just always there and just seeing these new places. And, you know, I tell people, it's like, it's not just the Grand Canyon, it's side canyons. And then it's side canyons of side canyons. You know, I mean, it's like, it's a fractal when, and each of those little nooks and crannies have something interesting. You're so right. There's all these little niches and little pockets that you can experience at the canyon. And I think it's, that's what always keeps people coming back because there's always something new to experience and to see. And, you know, logging all the miles that you have had, and being able to still personalize it to those spots in the canyon, I think is neat too, and keeps you coming back. And so I do want to know for any of our viewers today, um, maybe just getting interested in hiking or even trying some longer hikes or section hikes, what advice do you have for them? My number one piece of advice is always to do your research. There's so much information out there right now that you can find what you need to prepare yourself. And also, I also suggest talking to people that have done this before, because while it might seem like something, you know, wildly unusual to you, there's a system for things. Um, and that's the thing that I learned hiking, you know, and backpacking and stuff. It's like you figure out your own systems for things. And so if you can talk to somebody who's already got those systems figured out for themselves, you can use those and then, you know, uh, work on them and you know personalize them to yourself once you're getting you know more experience and stuff like that you can find what works for you what doesn't and so i say research and then also just talking to people there's some really great uh forums out there you know for chatting with people facebook groups the grand canyon hikers and backpackers association is fantastic for ask asking questions and so I would say just research is most important. And then also, uh, you know, just believe in yourself and don't be afraid to turn around if it doesn't feel right. Um, when I first started hiking, I used to do that a lot. And, you know, it's, it doesn't always have to be about the objective. You know, you can plan a hike and then as long as you're safe, you know, not maybe get to your objective, but still have a really great time. So you brought this up a little bit earlier in terms of, you know, just getting out there and starting to work with the National Scenic Trail Association and things, but really um, what was your process for writing your book and how was it trying to hike and write and gather all that content at the same time? So I came up with the idea for this book in 2009. I actually just found these two pieces of paper when I was cleaning my house recently. And it's an outline of a guidebook for day hiking the Arizona Trail from 2009. Um, at that point, it wasn't 
even completed yet. And so, and I was pretty new to the trail myself. And so it just wasn't the right time for it. But after working for the Arizona Trail Association and, you know, having the experience of working with the publisher, uh, when the original guidebook came out, I was a contributing author to the original guidebook. And so those things have always been there in the back of my head. You know, the, the idea has always been there in the back of my head to create a way for the Arizona Trail to become more accessible to people. Because one of the things that I've always heard is, you know, oh, it's 800 miles. I can't possibly do that. And then people self-select out and they don't think about it. And it's like, no, you don't have to do the whole thing to be a part of the Arizona Trail. And I think that's one of the things that I like so much about long distance hiking and long distance trails is that no matter where you are, you're a part of that. And no matter how long of a hike you do, nobody's gonna like, come up and be like, well, did you do, you know, 10% of the Arizona trail? You know, like as long as you're a part of the Arizona trail and you're on it, you're part of that community and that long distance trail. And, you know, if you're in one of the gateway communities, you're part of that trail. And so I think that my biggest goal was to make this something that people could feel like they could do no matter where they were at in their hiking experience, even if that meant that they had never hiked before. And so one of the interesting things was that I had to go back to that beginner's mind. I went out and I rehiked everything with this idea that if I was a beginner, I would probably want frequent information about when another trail was coming up, a trail junction, which way to go. Also, it was really important for me to tell people what they were looking at because I wrote this from the perspective of somebody coming and knowing nothing about Arizona. Like I said, the perspective that I had when I moved here without ever visiting. And so I make sure to tell people about what mountains are they looking at? Um, what trees are they walking through? Uh, is there a, is there a, a structure that they're walking past and what's the history of that? Is there a ranch? What's the ranch's history? You know, things like that. And, you know, obviously in the Grand Canyon, what's the geology and also information about ancestral lands and indigenous people of Arizona. And I think all of those things combine to make such a richer experience. So as a lot of people, you know, COVID impacted all of us. So I'm curious to know, for you, Serena, what were some things that you did to stay outside or just kind of keep yourself sane during a year of quarantine and lockdown? Well, one of the things that came out of quarantine that I appreciate is that I got to explore close to home, really, you know, like those places where you're like, oh, I wish I had a bunch of time to spend there. Well, now I did. And I pretty much stayed around Tucson the whole the whole time I did a couple of trips, but for the most part, I was just exploring my backyard. And that was pretty neat because like I said, there were some places where I was like, maybe I'd hike there once. And then, you know, I wanted to go back for a backpacking trip, but never really did. And it was those kinds of places that I could go back to. And then just being so grateful for the outdoors last year and during all of this, um, it's fed my soul in the same way that nature has for my fibromyalgia and, you know, dealing with chronic pain and things like that. So I just think in general, it's a pretty good coping mechanism. In my mind, you hiking the Arizona trail and doing as logging as many miles as you have, you are like the ultimate trailblazer. So I have to ask, um, I know you're going to be getting out and doing some trailblazing. Have you chosen a route yet and any hikes that you have in mind for your trailblazing? Well, if I had my way, I would come to the Grand Canyon. I'm not sure if that's going to work out with my schedule, but if I had my way, I would come to the Grand Canyon and I would either do the South Kaibab to Skeleton Point, which is one of my favorite hikes and is also the Arizona Trail. And you get to see the Colorado River from Skeleton Point, which is pretty fantastic. Also, I'm a huge fan of the Trail of Time and it's such an asset to the park to be able to see all of these rocks that are pretty inaccessible for the general public and to be able to learn about them and see more about the canyon. I always think that the more that you can learn about something, the more interesting it is, but that's also just my guiding 
background. So um, context is so important. It's so much more interesting to learn something rather than just looking at a rock. And so the Trail of Time does that really, really well. It's uh, it's definitely one of mine. I am a big fan of the Rim Trail at Grand Canyon. You know, um, I just hiked it on Sunday with uh, Teresa McMullen, our CEO, and shared as many updates about it as we could along the way. And, you know, we're going to be doing a deeper dive into the Trail of Time later this week. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. It's a great introductory one for people just coming to the park because it really gives you that educational look into what the canyon is below the rim without actually having to do it. Um, and it's great for just people that are just first time getting into hiking. Um, it's a paved path for the pretty much the most duration of it, especially all during the trail of time, the rim trail is paved. Um, and it is, it's, it's a good one. So I'm glad you brought it up. But then if for any of you guys that have also hiked South Kaibab down a skeleton point, uh, let us know too, that's a great route. And if you didn't know that was, that was part of the Arizona trail. So you can now all say, if you've hiked South Kaibab Trail, you've hiked on the Arizona Trail, just like Serena. So it has been a pleasure having you today. And I am so glad that we were able to share your story. Um, is there anything else that maybe we didn't touch on that you would like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, a lot of the things that I've covered in this discussion are in my book. So I wanted to make my book about the Arizona Trail, but also a way for people to learn about hiking itself and the desert. And so even if you're not planning on hiking the Arizona Trail, it has some really in good information for folks. And you can buy best day hikes on the Arizona National Scenic Trail at trailsinspire.com books. Best Day Hikes on the Arizona National Scenic Trail was produced in partnership with the Arizona Office of Tourism. And it also features a foreword by Roger Naylor, one of Arizona's most beloved authors. Okay, so Serena, so if people wanna learn more about you and your story, where can they find you? You can find me at trailsinspire.com, which is the consulting company. I'm also at serenarana.com and Instagram at Desert Serena and at Trails Inspire, as well as this Facebook page. Serena, thank you again for joining us and coming to support us during National Park Week and our virtual Grand Canyon Conservancy Trailblazer event. You really are one of the ultimate trailblazers and I'm so excited that we were able to share your story and also what your experiences have been with Green Canyon. So for those of you that are watching, you can still register and be a part of our virtual Trailblazer event. You can visit protect.greencanyon.org forward slash trailblazer to get started. And we'll put that link below in the comments as well. And if you don't wanna register, you can still donate to an existing page. All the funds go towards protecting and enhancing Grand Canyon National Park and supporting projects like trail maintenance on the South Kaibab Trail, which is just right um, behind me in this photo, as well as our big project out at Desert View to really help and cultivate those relationships and preserve that cultural heritage and working on some new projects like installing some pollinator gardens to help with monarch butterfly populations. Stay connected with us throughout the week because we're going to be continuing to share updates about our trailblazing progress as well as some fun educational content for you to stay connected no matter where you are. So thank you guys so much for joining us today and we'll be back with more content later this week. And so until then, happy trailblazing. Uh, don't forget to register and we will see you soon. Thanks again.